and including the special features. And uh, it encompasses from the science and uh, the philosophy to ancient civilization and many examples of the monuments and texts around the world that describe this information. And it has all sorts of um, interesting bonus features and interviews with my co-author, Dr. Elizabeth Rauscher. And, so and there are four CDs, right? Four DVDs. There's four DVDs, and so it's packed with information, and, uh, and it's, uh, it's a very um, in-depth view of the whole picture. Very good. Well, stay with us. We're going to have a final hour to go with you. And we'll take phone calls coming up next on Coast to Coast AM. If you need to email me, George at Coast to TO, Coast to Coast AM dot com. Back in a moment with phone calls on Coast to Coast AM. Well, as Nassim was just saying, dark energy may not exist. As a matter of fact, now a story breaking in the United Kingdom that the concept of dark energy was created by cosmologists to fit Albert Einstein's general theory of relativity into reality after modern space telescopes discovered that the universe was not behaving as it should. Well, now these two scientists, Blake Temple and Joel Smoller, mathematicians at the University of California and the University of Michigan, believe that they've come up with a whole new set of calculations that allow for all the sums to add up without the need for this controversial substance. The research, of course, could change the way astronomers view the composition of our universe. SM has been telling us this all along. We'll be back with phone calls next on Coast to Coast AM. Now, Sim, you might agree with these two scientists, these mathematicians, that they say, too, that it looks like dark energy may not exist. Yes. I, you know, like I was saying earlier, when you... When your equation is only able to predict 4% or 2% of what you're seeing, um, you know, you have a choice. You can start inventing all kinds of new stuff, or you can look at your equation and, and figure out where you made the error. And, uh, you know, I think the latter is uh, the preferred uh, approach, and, uh, and I'm glad that others are finding that out. If you had an opportunity to talk with Albert Einstein, what would you talk with him about? Um, uh, if I could talk to Einstein, I would definitely talk to him about black holes because his equations is, is the equation that actually, you know, predicted the existence of black holes, the possibility of black holes. But when it was rendered at his time, he didn't like that answer. He actually wanted to get away from singularity and black holes. He, you know, he thought that made his um, equations invalid at that level. And, you know, in general, most physicists thought so too. And, but they said, well, you know, that part of the curvature, that part of the result we're going to ignore, and we're just going to take the, the weak curvature. Uh, because they thought, we'll never find such an animal. We'll, that probably doesn't exist. It's just a function of the math. And, uh, and then eventually we start to find evidence of black holes in the cosmological world, you know, in the center of galaxies and quasars and all this stuff. And, and then it's like, wait a minute, there is really black holes out there. They do exist. And, uh, and, uh, but Einstein was long gone by then. And, uh, so I think that if Einstein would have um, looked deeper into that possibility of black holes, of singularities, I think he could have uh, solved unification if he would have applied those to the atomic world. But you see, it was so unreasonable to even think that those things existed in the cosmological world at the time never mind applying that to the atomic level, you know. So it, it, you know, it, even today when I talk to people about me, atoms being mini black holes, you know, it's kind of shocking. <laughs> to the phones we go. You ready? Yes. Ann Arbor, Michigan we go. Rod, get us started. Go ahead, Rod. Yes. Um, Nassim, um, I have two questions. The first is when you talk about infinite division of space, uh, 
Mm -hmm. Does, doesn't this conflict with the Planck volume limit? Uh, what is it, uh, 10 to the minus 99th cubic centimeters? No, it, it, 10 to the minus 33 centimeters is the Planck's um, that, that, limit. That's the length limit. The volume limit would be... Uh, oh, the volume, yes, yes. Well, you know, um, in in the case, uh, yeah, in the, it, it, you know, what my theory says is that the Planck's limit is actually, you know, one of the limits. It's one of the boundaries. It's the boundary that defines, um, you know, our world viewed from our scale. Oh, I see. But that there's actually further divisions and, the, and that there are possibilities. And actually there's data that just came out last week uh, from Hubble tem Telescope Pictures that starts to debate the validity of... Uh, that limit being the end, there's, there's evidence that actually there might be resolution past the Planck's limit. Oh, really? Yes. Oh. So look it up. It yeah. just came okay, out well, last that, few weeks. That, that makes uh, a lot of sense then. And my other question is, are you familiar with Roger Penrose's ideas about the connection between quantum mechanics and consciousness through uh, quantum coherence taking place in the microtubules and living cells? And and if you know about this, what do you think about it? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I think Penrose um, did a wonderful work in there uh, in that field with, um, with the microtubules and the relationship to the twister algebra. Um, yeah. And, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, um, and I actually, um, much of what he did is uh, very compatible with what I did. And I, you know, if you go to my website on the research link, you'll find uh, papers uh, about that. Uh, one that was uh, published, um, you know, uh, a year or so ago. And um, oh, really, I mean, uh, on that subject. Yes. Really. Yeah, well, on, on the subject of the solution to my equation having a relationship with uh, the uh, different algebras and, um, you know, not directly the microtubule and the relationship to consciousness, but certainly in the relationship between these algebras. Now, you know, interestingly, in one of my papers, I show a scaling law. And that scaling law has, uh, uh, you know, a relationship between the frequency of systems uh, and uh, and their size, their radius, and and I plot on it from the Planck's distance, from extremely small to the universal size, and I plot all the objects in between, and they line up nicely along. Uh, uh, gradual expansion line and interestingly when you take the microtubule their size and their frequency and you plug them on there they bisect that line between the Planck's distance billions of times smaller than the atom and the universal size like almost in the middle so it's like biology is like the connection between the two it's kind of exact kind of almost perfectly in the middle between the two. So I think that's very interesting. It's, uh, we're part of that network of information between the large and the small. Next up, we go to Phoenix, Arizona, west of the Rockies. Keith, it's your turn. Hey there, George. Nice talking to you again. Thanks, Keith. A very nice show. Um, I was just wondering, uh, is that, that dark matter, is it, is it the explanation for the weight of the universe? Um, the dark matter and dark energy, mm -hmm. well, dark matter certainly is uh, because when you look at galaxies, mm -hmm. um, you know, and you look at the way they behave, um, there's a whole bunch of mass missing for it to behave well, that way relative has, to the way the equation should have it behave. Has anyone thought about life being that mass? But about life? Yes, like human beings. <laughs> on other planets or beings on other planets being that mass that's missing? Unless they were very massive beings. Um, well, yeah, if, you have, if you have trillions upon trillions upon trillions of these, these smaller beings, wouldn't they equal some sort of mass? Well, um, 
even if they were pretty massive beings, like if they ate a lot of fast food, <laughs> um, they, you know, relative to the mass of a galaxy, they, it would be trivial. But, um, but what I'm saying is that actually, you know, this feedback from the vacuum, this vacuum energy, this uh, fundamental uh, super fluids, uh, super conductive uh, structure we call space, is actually the source of that energy. I have uh, one more question. Sure, go ahead. Um, I was just wondering what your thought would be on uh, life existing, you know, other than in a flesh form, more in a maybe metallic form, say, mercury for blood, water is mercury, different, just a different structure. But different life. 